Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. In the high stakes game of global AI, is raw computing power the ultimate trump card? Or are there hidden strategies that can truly level the playing field? Today, we're taking a close look at a recent article in The Economist about China's top tier AI models and its, well, its struggle to run them effectively. We'll unpack its insights, definitely. But we also want to layer in some crucial context, maybe offer a more nuanced perspective, and challenge some assumptions along the way. You're about to discover how the narrative around AI and global tech competition is uh, maybe far more intricate than it often appears. So let's start with The Economist's perspective. The article really kicks off by highlighting China's, frankly, remarkable strides in AI development. You know, despite facing significant export restrictions, firms like DeepSeek and Moonshot AI with their Kimi K2 model, they've managed to produce these open source AI models. And these models don't just rival, but in some specific areas actually outperform Silicon Valley's giants like ChatGPT 4.1, Claude 4 Opus, we're talking serious capabilities in coding, scientific research, that sort of thing. But here's where it gets really interesting. The crucial twist the article points out. Despite having these, you know, world beating models, they're hitting a very practical wall. The core issue, as the article frames it, is inference. Right. For those less familiar, inference is simply the process of actually running these huge pre-trained AI models. It's when you ask an AI a question, basically. Exactly. That's the operational part. And it turns out it's incredibly compute intensive. That seems to be the real choke point for China. The article even describes Kimi K2 as being so Yeah, sluggish. And notes that DeepSeek has had to delay major launches specifically because of these performance hurdles. And what's truly fascinating in The Economist's framing is how it emphasizes the economics here, this bottleneck. It points out that serving these large language models, just running them day to day over their lifetime, can cost far, far more than the initial training. Wow. Think of it like um, training an Olympic athlete, spending millions, but then not having the stadium or the right track for them to actually compete. Right, right. So even with these state-of-the-art models, if you don't have enough of that mid-tier silicon, the chips needed to run them efficiently at scale, they just feel sluggish, almost unusable for really broad applications. And the article then positions the recent lifting of the ban on NVIDIA's H20 chips as this a significant boon for China, suggesting, you know, this would be the key to removing those hurdles. And the article also dives into a rather, let's say, pragmatic reason behind China's focus on open source releases, like DeepSeek V3 and Kimi K2 being available on Hugging Face. Mm. The implication is this isn't purely about sharing knowledge. It's maybe primarily a sanctions workaround. A way to get around the restrictions. Exactly. The thinking is, if Chinese companies can't directly get the advanced chips, perhaps by making their models open source, others, maybe GPU-rich hobbyists or Western startups using platforms like Hugging Face, can effectively host and deploy Chinese R&D, diffusing it beyond U.S. controls. And look, on the surface, that explanation is certainly compelling. It makes sense. The economics of inference really do dominate the long-term costs of these LLMs, making it a critical strategic point. And the idea that openly releasing model weights could blunt hardware asymmetry, well, allowing thousands of dispersed GPU-rich folks and Western startups to host Chinese R&D is a potent argument. It diffuses innovation, bypasses hardware limits. Yeah. We also see this reflected in the sort of mixed policy signals from Washington, right? They seem caught between wanting to contain China's tech rise and maybe keeping them somewhat dependent on Western tech. It's a very real balancing act they're trying to pull off. But this brings us to a really crucial question. Is the narrative presented in The Economist, while insightful, is it the full picture? Exactly. What if some of these solutions or problems are actually framed in a way that overlooks bigger, perhaps more complex dynamics at play? Precisely my thought. Let's take that framing of H20 access as a game changer. Okay, the ban reversal is real. It offers some relief, sure. But it's really not the magic bullet it might seem. Okay, why not? Well, for context, the H20 delivers barely one-third of the FPA throughput of an H100. One-third? That's significant. The big gap. FPA throughput is basically a key measure of raw number-crunching power for AI math. So yeah. major performance difference. And then there's the volume. The reported 300,000 H20 dies from TSMC. They're not even expected to ship until late Q4 2025. Right. And that volume covers less than 40% of China's projected inference demand just for 2026. So the reality is that compute scarcity is going to persist even with this ban lifted. So helpful, maybe, but not a fundamental shift in the landscape. Not at all fundamental, no. And let's maybe push back a bit on the idea that open source is just a sanctioned dodge. 
Okay. While that's likely a component, it's also a really powerful form of soft power, isn't it? How so? Think about it. When global developers fine-tune and build upon Chinese weights, they're not just hosting models. They're feeding back bug fixes, they're improving the models, mm -hmm. and crucially, they're boosting the brand equity and mindshare of Chinese AI companies. Ah, like free R&D and marketing in a way. Exactly. It really mirrors Meta's own Llama strategy, which has been highly successful for them. So while hardware scarcity is part of the story, open source adoption is arguably a much broader long-term strategic play than just a simple workaround. What about the broader claim then, sometimes implied, that China inherently lacks true domestic compute capabilities, that they're totally dependent? That's another key point to examine critically. Look at Huawei's Ascend 910C, for example. It already runs at about 60% of an H100's inference throughput. 60% is not insignificant. Not at all. That's a serious contender. And when you factor in China's often cheaper coal-generated power, and the fact that many AI workloads don't actually need that ultra-low latency you'd need for, say, a self-driving car. Right. Different use cases. Exactly. The Ascend can actually undercut NVIDIA significantly in terms of total cost of ownership for many applications. So this isn't really a lack in domestic compute so much as a different, potentially very competitive and rapidly emerging domestic solution. It's just often overlooked in the Western narrative. And following on from that, is the U.S. truly retaining stable leverage with these export controls, given everything we're seeing, the workarounds, the domestic development? Well, the counter evidence is getting quite strong there, I think. The continued, frankly, massive flood of banned chips. I mean, estimates suggest at least a billion dollars worth slipped into China just between April and June this year alone. A billion dollars. That clearly shows that hardware-only controls leak badly. Mm. And we're seeing the rise of what people are calling cloud-to-cloud -cloud compute laundering. Yeah. Basically, compute capacity being resold or rerouted through various global cloud providers. Okay, so it's getting harder to track. Much harder. And it indicates that future control points will probably have to shift. Things like software and location attestation rules, verifying where and how compute is being used, might become far more important than just trying to ban physical chips at the border. So the current approach is like playing whack-a-mole. Pretty much. <laughs> whack-a-mole with physical goods, while the real action is moving into the digital, verifiable realm. This is where it gets really compelling for our understanding. Beyond just challenging the existing narrative from, say, The Economist, what bigger systemic dynamics might most mainstream analysis be overlooking here? Yeah, I think there are a few really significant ones. One is supply chain bifurcation. Bifurcation. Splitting, exactly, splitting into two. Every single month, there's a delay in China accessing advanced Western chips, pushes their big hyperscalers, the Alibabas, the Tencents, to standardize more and more on their domestic technologies. Yeah. Like, Huawei's Ascend chips and their own proprietary interconnects, the things that link the chips together. Mm -hmm. This isn't just about coping short term. Yeah. No, it's actively eroding NVIDIA's future total addressable market in China. Mm -hmm. Even if U.S. policy loosens significantly down the line, these companies might have already switched tracks. It's driving a long-term strategic divergence, two distinct tech ecosystems forming. So the restriction itself is kind of forcing China's hand, accelerating their self-sufficiency, creating this parallel tech universe almost. Precisely. It's a classic case of unintended consequences, perhaps. What else is being missed? Another missing piece, I think, is the issue of dollar and intellectual property, IP leakage. How these deals are financed. Those smuggled GPUs, for instance, they aren't typically paid for with standard bank wires that are easily tracked. Right. They're often paid for in USDT, that's Tether, a stablecoin, a type of cryptocurrency pegged to the US dollar. And these transactions are frequently cleared through informal, over-the-counter desks, often in Hong Kong. Ah, so outside the formal financial system. Largely. And this setup profoundly weakens formal export control audit trails. It makes it exponentially harder to track the flow of money, and crucially, the flow of the actual advanced technology itself. It's not just about the physical chips, it's the financial plumbing enabling their illicit trade that's hard to shut down. That sounds like a much deeper, more pervasive problem than just trying to inspect shipping containers at ports. It absolutely is. Much harder to control. And finally, there's a growing cloud sovereignty push that's playing out globally. Cloud sovereignty. Yeah, countries wanting control over data and compute within their borders. We're seeing data center operators in regions like ASEAN, Southeast Asia, and the Gulf states actively drafting what are called node attestation rules. Okay, what are those? Basically, rules about verifying the origin, the security, the integrity of cloud compute resources operating in their territory. 
Now, if the U.S. continues to tie chipped firmware, the embedded software, to geofencing, preventing their use in certain locations. Which they seem intent on doing. Right. Then compute-rich neutral hubs in these regions, places like Singapore, maybe the UAE, could emerge as critical arbitration markets for compute power. Arbitration markets. Places where compute can be bought, sold, and verified outside of direct U.S. or Chinese control. This fundamentally shifts the control point, not just from the physical hardware itself, but to where and how that compute can be verified and legally used. And that has potentially profound geopolitical implications for who controls the future of AI infrastructure. Okay, so given all these shifts, these complexities, what are the practical takeaways here? For the key players, Chinese labs, NVIDIA, U.S. policymakers, investors, what should they be focusing on right now? Good question. For Chinese labs, the clear message seems to be double down on efficiency. Efficiency? Yes, AI efficiency techniques. Things like sparse mixture of experts, forbid inference. These are advanced methods to make AI models run faster using less memory and power. Like getting more miles per gallon from your AI engine. Exactly. It's essential for them to stretch their limited pools of H20s and Ascend 910Cs. They should also be actively courting partners in places like Indonesia the UAE, looking for that overflow compute capacity in those potential neutral hubs we just discussed. Right. And for NVIDIA and its suppliers, what's their move? They should absolutely treat the H20 as a temporary fix, a stopgap. Their immediate urgent focus needs to be on designing the next generation of export compliant chips. Compliant from the start. Compliant from the start, before the next iteration of BIS firmware locks and even stricter regulations land. Because they will land. The tech and regulatory landscape is moving incredibly fast. What's allowed today might be banned tomorrow. They need to skate to where the puck is going. Makes sense. What about U.S. policymakers? Where should their efforts be directed, given the leaks and workarounds? The really critical insight here, I think, is to shift focus. Move away from just counting FLOPS caps on individual chips, that raw performance metric. Which seems hard to enforce anyway. Exactly. And move towards developing systems for verifiable cloud compute licenses tracking and auditing compute usage in the cloud, not just trying to stop physical chips at the border. And crucially, they need to check and plug those gray market financing channels, like the USDT flows we talked about. That's probably more effective long term than chasing individual containers of smuggled hardware. The real battleground for control has moved beyond physical silicon. It's moved to the cloud and the financial networks. Precisely. It's about auditable compute and the money flows. And finally, for investors keeping a close eye on this space, what should they be wary of or looking for? Investors need to be cautious about assuming continued super high margins on high-end AI silicon, especially in the China market. What I call peptide-like margins might be unrealistic going forward. Why? Because Huawei's continuously improving Ascend chips offer a domestic alternative with a different cost curve. Combine that with a persistent influx of smuggled, discounted H-class GPUs, and it will inevitably put a cap on NVIDIA's average selling prices in China. So more competition, downward price pressure. Exactly. The real, perhaps more sustainable, long-term upside for investors probably lies more in secure cloud infrastructure, the software stacks that enable verifiable and secure compute, rather than just betting on the raw silicon vendors alone. And if we just tie this back quickly, while the recent U-turn from the U.S. administration on some export controls like the H-20 certainly eases one immediate pain point for China, that boon seems quite limited, quite bounded. The mid-tier nature of the H-20, the limited volumes, that persistent billion-dollar smuggling pipeline, and Huawei's improving domestic chips, all these factors are eroding Washington's leverage faster than any new licenses can really compensate. The real battleground, as we've discussed, is truly shifting. It's moving from chips you can physically count to compute you can reliably audit and verify. That idea that the true control point is shifting from physical hardware to auditable compute, that's a really profound thought, isn't it? It really challenges our basic assumptions about how technological power is wielded and maintained in this interconnected world. So as you, our listener, reflect on this, maybe consider... How will this increasing focus on audible compute reshape not just the AI industry itself, but the very nature of technological sovereignty? How might it change international relations? What implications could this have for global data centers, for software development practices, and maybe even for future innovations that we can't even quite imagine yet? Something to think about.